So, Marion, here we are on a Sunday morning on the deck in your house in Berkeley. And at last, we're taking some time to speak together. I've wanting, been wanting for a long time now to talk with you about your experiences growing up in Germany and then leaving Germany and leaving your homeland and coming here. So, as I was thinking about it, I realized that I wanted to begin, actually, by asking you to tell the story about a vision that happened to you shortly before you left Germany. Would you tell that to me now? Um, usually I'm a bit hesitant to talk about it, but it, it was probably to me a more important experience than I knew for a long time. It was the night before what they called the Crystal Night, when the Nazis came and destroyed uh, the homes of Jewish families. And it was before that happened, so when we did not know about it yet. And I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. It's, it felt more like a vision than a dream. And it was a woman who, whose face appeared on the sky, and it was, the whole sky was just that woman's face. She wasn't particularly pretty or particularly important looking, she was just a person. And she said to me, don't worry, I will look after you. Nothing will happen to you. And that was all. And I couldn't really figure out what this was about. It was just what sometimes, you know, sometimes you have an experience like that. So I didn't think about it anymore. Until the next morning, when I had heard what had happened the night before. That a lot of the Jewish men had been taken to concentration uh, camps, that many of the homes had been destroyed. And I was kept wondering what had happened to my family. I was not at home at that time. I was in Hamburg doing some studying in Mensendick gymnastics. In what kind of gymnastics? Mensendick, it was called. I don't feel like going into that anymore. I was just there le trying to learn something different. Uh -huh. And uh, so nobody knew where I was. So I was with my sister there in a place where it was very safe. But this is what happened. And how about your family? My father happened to be on a train during that evening, so nothing happened to him. My mother and older sister were at home, and one of the SS men who was coming up to destroy some of our furniture, he sent his little boy in the middle of the night to warn them, mm. which was very touching mm. because the boy, I think, was nine years old, had to walk in the dark to come up to us, tell us that something was happening, or to my parents' house. And so when they came, they had already been forewarned. And it was not such a shock. But the people uh, did some damage. They broke, especially broke uh, glasses, and plates that were very beautiful. But they did not hurt the piano. They put it very carefully on its side, so it looked as if something had happened with it. Mm. But they destroyed, actually, as little as possible. What is your understanding of, of uh, the kindness in the midst of that kind of nightmare? There were many kinder people 
who had to comply for their own safety and were not strong enough to rebel. If they had rebelled, it probably would have meant concentration camp for them or whatever, and for their families. But they certainly did not feel good about what they had to do. For example, the SS man who sent his child, was he a friend of yes, the family? Yes, he was a friend of the family. Yeah. Or had been for a long time. So take me into the experience a little bit more uh, before this vision and before this night. Uh, what was the impact on you? What was it like for you uh, growing up in Germany with this growing uh, intensity of Nazism? I guess I was not aware of the significance of the Nazism until I was about 16 years old, when I was very much in love with a boy who was a bit older and who also was in love with me. And he was a, a medical student. And he came one morning to walk me to school, like he just did when he was home. And the next day, my mother told me that he couldn't see me anymore. And I was totally crushed. So much so that I considered doing away with myself. Whoa. Uh, the next day then, I got a letter that she had uh, gotten from him and saying that he couldn't see me anymore and that uh, he was sorry about it, but he couldn't see me anymore. How did she know? Without any explanations. How was she? His mother had called my mother mm. and told her that they have forbidden him to see me mm. because I was Jewish and he wasn't. Mm. And I don't know if they told her, <clears throat> or I heard later, that they said if he was going on to see me, they would not support him anymore, that he would not be able to go to medical school and they just would not want anything to do with him anymore. And he chose that instead of me. And that was an incredible shock for me yes. that this could happen. Yes. So with no forewarning? No forewarning. From one day to another, there was this most important thing in my life was destroyed. And there I really got a taste of what it was, maybe of what was to come. Not really intellectually, but emotionally. I had been uh, very well liked and I had been the belle of the ball, mostly. And all of a sudden, I was not only not good enough, I was danger. I was something not to associate with. Some, oh, what do you like mean a cast danger? Out. What do you mean danger? That you were danger? Well, I was, it, the danger was to the people who were with me, because then they could not, they could not, were not allowed to study. They were not as later turned out, there was even more implication about that, that they, they, a law came out that Jews and Gentiles could not have affairs, that the man would go to prison if that would happen. Did this come after? Afterwards, uh -huh. yeah, quite a few years after. Uh -huh. and it, but it was that feeling I already had when I was 16. And before this happened when you were 16, I'm trying to get a sense, did it all happen suddenly? <clears throat> it happened suddenly with your boyfriend, but was there already a, apparent changes going on in the culture? There were changes coming on, but 
I guess I did not pick them up that way. I was not not that much aware of them, so I should have been. And your family, was your family particularly aware of them? They may have been aware of it, but my father uh, was very uh, this is, I don't find the word now what to say. He believed in Germany and he could not believe that anything like Nazism could happen to a country like Germany that was so cultured and was so far ahead in so many ways of the other countries that something would happen that, that as it happened, he just absolutely denied it could happen. And this is why we stayed in Germany so long. So the changes were coming, but they didn't affect your family that much and your, and your father's belief. Belief, yeah, it did not. It did not shake his belief in Germany at how that about, time. How about you, your own belief in Germany? Or your own experience, do you remember? Up till then, it it was very high. I was very, you know, very much involved with the admiration for what Germany stood for, and very proud to be a German. Mm. Much more than being a Jew. Ah, so you're. That's that's big. So your yeah. sense of yourself was as was a German. As a German, yes. Were you raised as a as a practicing Jew? No, that was the trouble too. I was by race. I was a Jew, but I was raised in the Protestant faith. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes. So your religion was Protestant. My religion was Protestant, and I went to church instead of the temple. And also, most of my friends were non-Jewish, so I did have some Jewish friends. But the majority of, of friends was non-Jewish. Wow. That gives a particular context. Yes. To having it all just stripped away That's like right. that. Starting with your boyfriend at 16. Yeah. And that was hard because all of a sudden I did not belong to this, to this group, this life anymore. And I did not belong to the other one either. I was a person without a country, without a home, without an affiliation, except for the family. And I think that is what made going away so hard, because I really went away on my own. You, you, you left family, you left homeland. Yes. How long after, first of all, how long uh, was there between your boyfriend not saying he would, could not, he chose not to see you anymore at 16 and Crystal Knight? There was, um, I think, th four years was uh, f or five years in between there. Yeah. And that period was very much then a, the the whole phase of not being the bell of the ball, not being the center of things, having your friends not not st stand with you. Yeah. There was one thing that happened that made everything very different, and it was this woman, Mrs. Heyer, who trained me in this relaxation work and who was willing to train me so she really was not supposed to, treat, to train a Jewish person. And that was a very happy two years that I spent training with her in Munich and really got myself uh, a new identity gave myself a new identity of being 
being myself again, more than before, being stronger. Also doing something that I felt was extremely exciting and worthwhile for me. And having people making all kinds of sacrifices in order to give me what I needed. What do you mean by sacrifices? Well, by taking chances on being found out that they were teaching me. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. What made that possible? What gave her that courage? She was the kind of person she had it. <laughs> you know, she was just an incredible person. And I think that's what made the work so meaningful to me, that a person like that would do this kind of work. Uh, fearless and determined. And fearless in what? Fearless of, of re recriminations. Yes. Determined to teach me, finding me very worthwhile to teach and being at the same time a very soft and feminine person. I think she was a wonderful, a wonderful idol to, to follow. And I think of her a lot, always, with lots of gratitude. It was not only she, it was the whole circle she was in, of many of the people there who were feeling like she did. Her sister, Edith Grote, and some of the other pupils that she was teaching. Some of her clients that she allowed me to work on. So they all knew that you were a Jew? Yes, and that she was. She and they yeah. were all taking a great risk. Yes. One of them was a, one of the uh, princesses, or, or not princesses, it was, a, I think, a duke or duchess of, of Bavaria. And I would go to there. I don't know if it was a palace, but it was a, a very special place they lived in to give her treatments. And I came there on my bicycle, and she would be most gracious meeting me at the door, you know, letting me in, and treating me with great respect. So I was only about 22 or 23 at the time. What a vivid uh, picture of the, of the contrast. Yes. And with all that was stripped away, with all yeah. that you lost, and that you were taken in by this circle and that you could bicycle up to the palace yes. and, and be taken in. Yes. Uh, and she would put herself in this, that kind of relationship with you by having yes. you work on her. Yes. Acknowledging, you know, to receive something from somebody like me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And of course, important also at that time was that I fell in love again the first time after this breakup with the boyfriend, it was about six years later. All this, these years between 16 and 22, there was nobody that I got close to, except this man later on, when he was, he was, I think, 30 and I was 22 or 23 when I met him. Was he part of the circle? He was part of this circle, yeah. Also there. And he was also like the previous boyfriend, a medical student, who taught me quite a bit about basic things I needed to know about anatomy and physiology, but in a very inspired way. It really let me look at the at the body with a already at that time with a kind of awe. I think that came from this time that I was so, so excited about working with the body. Say some more about your awe, the awe. The way a body worked, the connections in the body between, 
between emotions at that time and the physiology and between the physiology and the anatomy uh, about the nervous supply to a body and the muscle action. There was a lot of that got started at that time. A lot of that made me start thinking on my own, I guess. Not just take things out of the book, but learning the things the way he he presented them. Mm -hmm. yeah. How was it possible? How was it possible for you to uh, uh, get so excited and and go so deeply into life at this time when all around you uh, was craziness? Search me. <laughs> <laughs> It was just, I think, the kindness and the, and the power of some of these people that uh, restored my faith hmm. into the German people hmm. and maybe into human beings. Hmm. You know, and it was important. But there were also other friends at that time who, who made me really believe in the still in, in the German soul, so to say, that there were Germans who came up to my beliefs in Germany, like my friend Bärbel, who I'd met when I was 19, and who now, 60 years later, is still my friend. Mm -hmm. We still see each other. We still uh, enjoy each other's company whenever we can get together and it stayed over the years. And she, at that time, would protect me as much as she could in her own way. Mm. Like, how did she protect you? Well, take me places that I wouldn't get to otherwise. In the mountains or dancing or whatever I like to do, she would do with me and was always there, not allowing anybody to say anything about Jews or about me. Were there. you free to move around at that time? Yes, I was. So I was, except that there were signs all over. We don't want Jews here. Was so, this also the time when stars had been uh, uh, required, that Jews wear stars? No. So it was before that? Before that. Okay. And of course, I did not look particularly Jewish. I was much taller than most, most people at that time. And I guess my people did not necessarily know that I was Jewish looking at me. So you moved f freely and Baribel really made that Made it possible. possible, yes. And there was also another young boy who I was definitely not in love with, but who was an incredibly decent human being who would take me wherever I wanted to go and would see to it that I was safe. He was a bit younger than I was, but he was so upset about these things happening in Germany. I think that was part of it and his way of opposing them was to protect me. I, I think I'm getting a, more of a glimpse into your uh, belief and commitment into possibility and magnificent, magnificence yes. in people. I definitely got that at that time. They were magnificent people, not the ones I expected it from, but these people I did not expect it from that were fantastic. So now, at the time that you're studying, are you living separate from your family? Yeah, I was in a different town. I was in Munich. First with an aunt of mine, and then later I had a, a room in, with another a person who was renting out rooms, who also was magnificent, and who told me that I would never have to worry if I wanted to see my boyfriend at my, at my room, 
<laughs> that she would absolutely, you know, watch out. Mm. And they have the security of that. Mm. And she had no reason to, to do that or be that way, except also as a, as a protest of what was happening. Uh -huh. yeah. so also courageous. People taking stands. Yeah, in their way. Yes, yeah. in these very ordinary ways which made a mm. tremendous difference. A tremendous difference in my life yeah. because it gave me freedom to learn, gave me freedom to go around. Well, tell me, what was it that uh, made you decide to, to leave? How did leaving Germany come about for you? Well, in the end, I was not allowed really to do anything anymore. We were not allowed to go to, to restaurants, to theaters, to university. We were not allowed to work. I could never have made a living on my own anywhere in Germany. And then really conditions got worse and worse, more and more frightening. People going to the to concentration camps and then by that time they would take the property away from Jews. My father, my father's business was taken away and our house was going to be taken away. So there was no place to stay. Was your no house taken? Was it In the end it was, yes. In the end it was. Everything was taken. So finally it was getting so bad that you no longer could move about even no. with the protection That's and support right. of your friends. Yes. And I could not, could not have a life there. Most of the young Jewish people in my age had emigrated. And of course the Germans could not, could not marry me, could not be with me. So there was nothing I could do. I could not work, I could not get married. I could not have um, a relationship. So there was nothing left. And then I was very glad to leave, to not be under that pressure anymore. How did your decision get made to leave? Was it a long time coming? Did it happen quickly? It happened really after that crystal night that a friend of my father's from Sweden came and said, I would like to take the girls. Uh, take them in, send them as soon as possible. And that was in November 38, and in February 39 we left, my sister and I left, to come to go to Sweden. Together? Together, Did, yes. Well, that's that's, that that's was wonderful good. that you could go together. That meant a lot, you know, that we went there together. My older brother had already left and was living in England, and my older sister was married at the time, and she didn't live with us, she lived with her husband's mother. And she left pretty soon afterwards too for Switzerland. For Switzerland? Yeah. Her husband was an actor and he had to be somewhere where German was spoken. So he... So they left together? So they left. No, he left first to get a job and she followed him. And your parents? And the parents left finally about a week before the war started to go to England. They came by in Sweden where we were sort of to see us and then went to England. And that was by that time about two days before the war started that they got into England. So all of your family got out They safely. all got out, yes. Alive. Alive. With no money, but with, with optimism in a way. That, that is the wonderful thing that I think I got from my parents. So your parents, even, even losing everything that, and family... They didn't lose everything. They lost their money, they lost their possessions. <laughs> They still had us alive and being all right. They had each other. And they had, my father got a job immediately again. 
in England because he had worked with them in business and he was again having a job as a businessman. Yeah. And then they found an, a little house they rented and my father, my mother took in paying guests. She had been quite a spoiled lady and without, <laughs> without minding, you know, she would cook and clean and whatever for them, have them there. So their lives really so radically changed too. They radically changed, but also in a way they didn't mind that. What they minded was that we were not with them anymore. That was difficult. But otherwise I never I've never heard my father complain. And if I'm fair I did not hear my mother complain either. So how was it for you in Sweden? What was it like? You had already been living separate from, from your family, yeah. so that wasn't the new part. But I was there waiting to get a visa to America. And this is where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to a place where I was free, where I could work at whatever I wanted to, and where I could, uh, where working was appreciated. In the other countries in Europe, it was still when you were a worker, you were a second-class person. Oh. And I just loved to work, to do something. And this w wanting to work is connected to your zest, your awe that you found for the body and the, the relaxation work? No, this was connected to my temperament. Uh -huh. I just loved to do something. I could not sit and not do anything. And so I didn't mind what I would do as long as I was allowed to do something. So this was you already? It was me, yeah. That was there. Yeah. And also in Germany to be not allowed to do something that really made that come out more. That for, I just wanted to go somewhere where I could do something. And so in Sweden this wasn't as possible either? No. You had to have a permission to do any kind of work, which I did not have. But I did work anyway, uh, black market work. I would treat people at that time. But I also took this course in physical therapy at one of the uh, hospitals there. I got a special permission to join them. And that was very, very interesting to me. And I not only learned, uh, again, about physical therapy, but I also learned Swedish without knowing it. All of a sudden, I could speak Swedish. I knew it because I would write my notes in German, and at one time, I would start writing them in Swedish. <laughs> so then I knew that I had gotten what was, what was going on. How long were you there in Sweden? About a year and a half. Wow. A year and a half, and you you really learned the language in that time. Yes. yes. But at, at first they always talked English to us, then we didn't learn, and then after six months they decided if we wanted to talk to them we would have to do it in Swedish. <laughs> and so we did. And it came. I also had lessons in the Berlitz school. It's good. And your intention all along was to come to, to America? To go to America, yeah. I had planned to go to New York because I had a, a job there waiting for me with, one, with a friend of that woman who, who was teaching me. And she had a lot to do. She was working for Karen Horney at that time, a pretty well-known psychiatrist. And she had so much work there that she would have liked me to come there. So she wanted you to come and do body work with yes. her? So why didn't you go to New York? Well, the Germans invaded Norway at that time, and I could not take a boat straight from Stockholm to New York, which I had planned to do. So I had to go through the Far East in order to get to America. So I first went to, to Estonia, and then through Russia, then through Japan, 
and arrived in San Francisco on my way to New York. And I had relatives who lived in Berkeley at that time. They picked me up and it was very close by here where they lived on Euclid Avenue. To where you're living right now? Yes, <laughs> about five blocks away maybe. <laughs> And I decided that was a place I was going to live for the rest of my life. Oh my. That was 53 years ago. I never had a hard time making up my mind when I wanted something, when I knew something I wanted. And I wanted to stay in Berkeley. Mary, where did you get this kind of clarity and knowing what you want and living it? No idea. Doesn't one come that way? Either one has it or one doesn't. Maybe. I don't know, but I, you know, yeah. it's really fairly amazing. How many years ago is this we're talking about? 53. 53 years ago, you arrived here unexpectedly, decided this is it. And stayed. And, and here you are five blocks from where you first stayed. <laughs> Maybe, you know, it's kind of boring to never go anywhere else. To just stay instead of expel Amending with other things, with other places. Well, we can hardly say that you're staying in the same place all the time since you travel so much with your work. Yeah, but I didn't mean to travel a lot. It just came by itself. At the traveling, of course, now it is very wonderful to travel, to have that possibility. To go back, to go back to Sweden, Scandinavia, go back to Germany. I was wondering, how is it? No what is way. it like for you to go back to Germany? You, you've gone back now a couple of times, uh, taking your work back there. I still love Germany. That is still so. And I love the people that I'm with when I am in Germany. And I'm still furious at the Nazis so furious, I don't think it's hate, it's just absolute fury that they did something to Germany that was the worst thing they could have do done to, to any country. You know. They degraded Germany. They degraded everything it stood for. And this, this fury has never lessened. It's still there. Fury and <coughs> love. Fury and love, yes. Both there. Both there. I love the countryside. I love the music. I love the people that I know there. Is there anything that you particularly miss about Germany? that you don't have in your life when you're not there? They have a way of, of flirting with each other, of looking at each other, of noticing each other, that I like very much, which I miss here. People, even with an old woman, you know, it is kind of nice to exchange glances with people. That is something that is very special. Oh, well, maybe this is, has something to do with this charm I see and flirtatiousness I see that come out, comes out in you, particularly when I see you uh, doing your exercise classes. Yes, something, something like that I feel when I'm there. Uh -huh. And yet I know I wouldn't want to stay. I would never want to stay. You wouldn't want to stay in Germany? No, not at all. But when I visit, of course, I have these very close friends that I visit. I visit her, Bertha, who helped me so much at that time. But I still am in contact now, again, with a friend I had the first day of school. I was sitting on the same bench with her. Mm. And I lost her for many years. She got married to a Nazi general. And she was not allowed to communicate with me. And after the war, she wrote to me again. And she said she was wondering if I would be willing to have contact with her. 
but she felt it so strongly. And I wrote back. And maybe a year or two later, one of her sons came here to visit. He wanted to see what I was like. And we got to be understood each other immediately. He became like a son. And the terrific thing is now that he and his wife both are studying Rosenberg in Germany and are totally enthralled by it, being, allowing themselves to grow and to expand in a wonderful way. I also got, went back to see my friend there again, and it was very good to be with her. Your friend from the first day of school? Yes, mm. who was married to the Nazi general. And somehow it was all right. I am amazed how little of a grudge I feel. I could understand the difficulties that happened at that time, you know. You, did not, you were not free as a German. Many ways, things you could not do. I also went back once and stayed with another friend who, during the war and many years, I had no contact with. And at that time, their children were visiting. Their children were maybe at that time in their late 30s. And the girl said she was teaching the Holocaust in the school where she was working. And all of a sudden, she looked at her parents and said, where were you at that time? And they couldn't answer. It was I who answered. It was what? It was I who answered. And I said, at that time, there was nothing you could do anymore. You put your family in danger. You put your life in danger and yet you could not really accomplish anything. And that's how it was. But they were more cowards than people in, like Mrs. Heyer and Ernst Hoffmann, who were not cowards, you know, and who stayed by their conviction and took a chance. But I still could understand them. I'm really, I, I hear that. I hear that you're able, that somehow you're able to hold it all. Yes, yes. But also the grudge, the grudge against the Nazis, the new Nazis, and everything that has to do with that philosophy is huge. That is there. mediating circumstances that could make that feel better. I never thought I was homesick. I always thought it was just wonderful that I could get away when I did and had this wonderful life here. But when I was visiting my hometown and we went for a walk at one of these places where we used to go as teenagers, bicycling and hiking, And all of a sudden, I had almost a heart attack. It was something, such a strong feeling and beating of the heart that came in. And then I realized that there was much more than I had allowed myself to feel. That there really was something that I deeply had missed. I really had missed 
a big part of my youth there. And I was I was sad about it. You know. There was a lot of missing. I guess life would have been different if I had not gone away. But there was some sweetness about it that I never regained. So I love it here. You know, I love it in many ways. But some sweetness got lost there. Thank you for speaking with me about this. It was very, very nice to be asked. I'm here on the far left, about maybe 11 or 12 years old. Then my younger sister Inge, who was four years younger. My oldest sister Edith, who was six years older. And my only brother, Herbert, who was four years older. This was at the age of 18 or 19, again in the Bavarian mountains, where we spent a vacation with the family. One at age 21, having a very good time with a friend and again being up in the mountains. Oh, this picture was taken when I was about 26 or 27, and it was already in Berkeley. And it was, and in this picture I'm 35, and that was shortly before the arrival of my daughter. <laughs> 